My name is Morgan Quigley, and this is Adam Leeper. We're from Stanford. I'm from the lab of Andrew Ng, and Adam is from the lab of Kenneth Salisbury. So the title of our proposal is called Stare on PR2. So then the first question is, what are we talking about when we say Stare? So Stare has been a long-running project in the Stanford Computer Science Department. We've been working on it for about four years now, uh, maybe a little more. Uh, the acronym is Stanford AI Robot Project. And the large goal is to create technology that it will be useful to put robots into every home and workplace. The way that we've uh, been approaching this problem is one of an integration problem as well as uh, developing subcomponents. So we've been looking at how do you integrate vision, or more specifically embodied vision on a robot, with manipulation, navigation, speech, and other subfields of robotics, which are, or of artificial intelligence rather, which have typically been um, kind of diverging over the past few decades. How can we bring them together into a physical embodiment onto a general purpose home and office robot? And the software systems work that we've done has evolved through several generations and, and ended up uh, having predecessors that di direct, uh, directly led to ROS. So the software integration stuff is, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's hard. It's one of those things that seems like it should be, be easy, but it's not. There's, there's many software programs, of course. That's a technical aspect. And then there's also many people or many trying to write code and get the code to talk to each other. So there's both uh, kind of technical and, and social aspects to this problem. That uh, the graph I put up there, on the, on the uh, right side is actually um, a graph I pulled out of an old paper from 2007 that, that Eric and I wrote about, um, this is trying to fetch a stapler, one of our original challenge problems as we were starting to look into stair, is how can a robot drive around and, and find staplers, you know, open doors, um, inventory things. And so that was one of our original graphs um, that we were doing with these things. I, I wrote um, a couple of things, I called one of them computer-based. This was like a class I was a TA for back in 2006, total fail. Um, then I wrote another one called uh, Switchyard, which is partial win, I think we could call it. Um, made some things work, but then we just gradually um, got more and more people involved, both uh, here at Willow and at Stanford, and uh, came up with, with this Ross thing, which is, is turning into a win, I think. So it's been uh, several iterations in the process here. So we have two of these stereo robots that we build over the years. Um, the first one is a relatively low capabilities, especially when compared to the, the PR2, but, but then... Um, it was a differential drive platform with a small robotic manipulator on it. And then we had an omnidirectional drive platform. You actually, that, it's hard to see in the picture there, but the, the kinematics of that omnidrive platform were, was the, one of the first versions of the PR2, what led to a PR2 uh, base. So the things that the stairs could do were um, they can open doors, they can operate elevators, clear tables, catalog items, fetch items. Um, but all those sort of have asterisks behind them in that I could give you a list of, of caveats to all of those capabilities. So with the PR2, we're hoping to reduce or eliminate these caveats and make these components and capabilities much more robust to, um, to continue to build up as we try to integrate larger and more complex applications. So I want to talk a little more about each of those things. And, and uh, this opening doors, um, Ellen Klingbeil, she's been uh, here off and on throughout the week. This has been, she's been working on this for um, quite some time now. With this stair robot, we can reliably go and, and identify a door latch when you see a picture of a door. Of course, doorknobs are, are beyond what our robot can do. Um, but door latches are now the, I think ADA compliance uh, requires a door latches in new buildings, which is great because they're easier for robots. Um, so the stair robots, we can, we can reliably detect the door latches. You can see these pictures. Ellen um, walked around with a camera all over the place on the Stanford campus and elsewhere, taking pictures of every door she could find. And you can see that it's drawing boxes there around the door latches. Um, and what's been kind of painful with our platforms to date is that sometimes we get the robot beautifully lined up, get the gripper on the door latch, and the motors just stall out. So we're really looking forward to have PR2 to have enough torque to, to get those sticky doors. I've personally oiled um, many doors in, in our uh, computer science building. It never seems like you have enough oil on those things for a little old robot. So PR2 is going to be great for that. Operating elevators also um, are something we've, that Ellen's been working on for a while. She's, uh, she went to San Francisco with a camera and got pictures of like 200 elevator button panels. And you, you, amazing to see the crazy ones you see sometimes. But um, her, her software can understand these button panels and, and um, you know, fit grids to them and figure out what, uh, what to do next. And so we can do these demos uh, in, our, in our building. We've done the demos in, in two buildings, actually, where the robot will drive and hit, hit the call button, go in the elevator. Um, the problem, you know, when I'm saying I have kind of asterisks behind each of these, these capabilities, one of them is that um, the stair robot is a differential drive platform. And so you hit the call button, and by the time the robot is backed away from the wall, turned, and headed to the elevator that it called open, the elevator is shut. And so we have to sit there and hold the door open. So we're looking forward to a PR2, which can uh, you know, drive sideways and then, and then go right in there quickly. 
Um, and also, in navigating inside an elevator with a differential drive platform is, is tricky, as you can imagine. If you have a big differential drive robot, there's not a whole lot of room to like plan and turn and spin. So the PR2, um, the holonomic base will be much nicer for that. So there's a the fun video here they have of us. Um, I, I also have been writing random Ross nodes recently, and uh, you know, th there's a check node. You can check email from Gmail. It's kind of fun. And uh, multi-floor navigation. Um, but let's see here. Uh, here we go. This is a fun video. Um, I sent an email to the robot and asked it to go to the second floor and take a picture of a room. So the robot checks its email every like 10 seconds or so. I think it's called stare the robot at gmail.com or something. But uh, it, it goes and tears off down the hall. And we get down uh, out in the open there. And now there's a, a system, a, a logic system that then says, well, I want to get on a different floor. And I'm sitting in the lobby now, so I should probably push the button. So you see it'll, uh, it'll go first scan using this uh, high, resolution, high resolution scanner. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, and then go whack the button. Uh, Yeah, and I kind of cropped out our helper that was holding the elevator door open there. <laughs> but again, we, we scan these elevator panels and then, and then image them and, uh, and can find out where the buttons are. So that's that. I'll kind of skip ahead here. But yeah, anyway, we're, we're running elevators. That's, that's the point there. <laughs> so we've also been working on fetch items where we try to use these high precision point clouds to, to identify things on, on tables and then grab them for you. This was a, a problem we had out uh, for a long while in terms of software integration. Because if you think of what happens when you want to fetch an item, there's lots of, lots of components in the chain that all have to work together. So we've done um, you know, listen to a spoken request, do the navigation, door opening, finding actual objects, grasping them, and then driving back to you. Uh, lots of piece, parts that have to work. And, and it's, uh, our, our platforms, honestly, before PR2, that's been a lot of kind of hardware hacking. So we're looking forward to have a, a PR2 where we, we can't just kind of blame the hardware uh, when we fail, but rather turn it back to a software problem. Cataloging items is an, a natural extension of that, where the robot, instead of fetching an item for you, it's rather driving around and, and taking pictures of desks or tabletops and trying to find things. So that picture is um, four rooms in our computer science building. We have, uh, we have boxes and boxes of coffee mugs we've collected over the years to do uh, training sets. So I, I took some of those boxes and just threw them down on the desks. And so there's, there's coffee cups all over the place. And, and we can now, with this stair robot, find with 100% capability, at least in a few experiments, of, um, of finding these coffee cups. It will be interesting um, to, to extend this, try to make this demo more, more robust by, by rather than hard coding locations of tables, rather having PR2 explore and, and find things. That's what I was uh, playing with PR2 this morning to, to move towards that direction. We've also been, been writing code to clear tables um, with our, our WAM uh, robot there. To, to, uh, if you put just arbitrary objects down on the table, we have a collection of just completely random things in boxes that we throw on tables um, to rather that cluster these things, then pick them up one at a time, find stable grasp points, and throw them in a box. Um, what we're looking at now, what will be interesting to see with the PR2 is to see what quality of 3D data do you need in order to handle these cluttered scenes with objects you haven't seen before. You know, is the active stereo good enough? Do you need better than that? Or is a laser scanner even good enough? So this is something um, in the very near future, what we're, we'll be doing is um, making a laser line scanner and then bolting that to the top of the PR2 head. This is some CAD on the lower right of a thing that will basically tilt a laser line generator. You can see if you kind of rotate it 90 degrees, that thing in the upper right is a laser stripe moving across the scene. So this will provide about millimeter level point clouds. And uh, you know, if you're closer, it's a little bit sub-millimeter. It's slower. It's about 10 second process. So it'll be complementary to the PR2 sensors. And it'll be interesting to see as we collect these large data sets of exploring and roaming and cataloging items if this actually helps or if active stereo is good enough. I, I haven't seen um, hard numbers on that, so it'll be interesting to see um, you know, quantitatively how these things compare. And this is the, the desk finding thing. I, was where you, I probably annoyed some of you by having the robot realm by your table this morning, but um, I was writing a, a, a kind of wandering application. You can see the, the kind of nonsense path the robot was doing there as it was trying to look around this morning here in this uh, that map is of, this, of this tent. OK, so now I'm going I'm to pass the microphone over to, to Adam Leaper here from the Biorobotics Lab.